As we saw in our last instalment, Australian music was in a dire state by the end of 1973. Due to both the might of Globus's industry and the sheer weight of quality product it was putting out to compete with the local acts, and chronic short-termitis from the local industry. It would have been hoped that the 1974 Sunbury Festival, the highlight of the year's music calendar, could restore some prestige and provide some impetus to local acts, but this was far from the case. Sunbury 74 ranged in varying degrees from a disappointment to an unmitigated disaster. While crowds were up on 1973, it was a significantly different crowd, predominantly wanting to boogie, drink in the summer sun and heckle the axe. Skyhawks were so badly mauled by the crowd that their singer quit when he got back to Melbourne. Sherbet, with their poppy, proggy blend, had a rough time of it as well, but the worst victims allegedly were Queen, who were quite reasonably unhappy with their sunset playing slot, feeling that it would not allow the crowd to see the spectacular light show they'd bought with them. After some pugilism and negotiation, local progsters Madder Lake took the stage so Queen could go on later. MC Jim Keyes, formerly of the Masters Apprentices, stirred up the well-lubricated crowd who proceeded to heckle Queen mercilessly. According to the myth that arose, Queen were all but booed off the stage, with Mercury vowing not to return to Australia until they were the biggest band in the world. That story has now been discredited, and witnesses such as Kerry McKenna of Manor Lake and Ross Wilson, who played with Daddy Cool in the slot before Queen was supposed to come on, said that Queen quickly won the crowd over and received a huge ovation, being invited back for an encore and Mercury promising to come back when they were the biggest band in the world. Which they did, but not to Sunbury. Because 1975 Sunbury was very much entirely an unmitigated disaster. Of course, none of this registered with me at my home, because over the Australia Day long weekend when the Sunbury Festival was held, my hometown was swallowed and almost destroyed by the most devastating floods in almost a hundred years. Tens of thousands lost everything, and many lost their lives. While some would say it took my hometown 15 years to rebuild after the floods, the Australian music industry managed a remarkable turnaround in just 12 months. These were due to four main factors or events, which we'll look at over the course of this presentation. Just as Helen Reddy broke through and dominated the US charts in 1972, giving an inspirational impetus to the local industry which schooled her, Olivia Newton-John took massive strides in the US in 1974. Too cruelly derided by Rolling Stone magazine at the time as a looker with a hook or a whispering French fashion model, imagine Rolling Stone criticising a female artist these days. John came from a background of lost opportunities and scrapping for every gig to position herself as perhaps the first truly modern country music artist. Wildly successful and wildly divisive in the genre, but still looking to exploit her natural marketability into a mass pop audience. And by 1978 and until 1981, she stood astride the world as a pop behemoth. It was the likes of her and Reddy that suggested that the US market, huge as it was, might be a better fit for Australian talent than the smaller, far more parochial UK markets that Aussie acts had traditionally tried to crack. And the seeds of the late 70s and early 80s invasion were sown. In the early 1970s, the Alberts Publishing Company reactivated its Alberts Production Record label, setting up studios in a concrete bunker in Western Sydney. Installing former Easy Beats Harry Vander and George Young, along with the key element, the unheralded engineer Bruce Brown, as their production team, they created what was in effect Australia's Motown, a hit factory which frequently landed 8 to 10 placings a week on the national top 40, encompassing everything from pop to glam to hard rock, disco and beyond. Vander and Young instilled a cracking work ethic and an incredible loyalty, not only to Alberts, but between the acts on the label. The analogy of the family is almost universally used by artists at the time. And family indeed it was. George's younger brother Malcolm was a regular session musician in the start-up days in 1973. Malcolm was occasionally joined by youngest brother Angus, although his contributions were fairly anonymous, and by 1974 the two younger Youngs had a band called ACDC, and they used what little downtime could be found at the Burwood Bunker to cobble together the lessons they learned from playing on the pub circuit. Chiefly that the pub circuit had little time for their glammy stylings and wanted a more basic hard rock sound. But Alberts were much more than ACDC. They were a hit factory with an identifiable sound, a formidable roster and an authentic local identity. And their rise was the rise of Australian music. Yeah. 
On November the 8th, 1974, the ABC aired its first ever episode of Countdown, a weekly pop music program designed for colour broadcast. Colour TV was still two months away in Australia. Based loosely and closely on BBC's Top of the Pops program, ending with a top 10 countdown which was usually composed entirely of pre-prepared film clips, a unique and innovative presentation which had a lasting influence on the world of music marketing. Initially hosted by a rotating cast of music celebrities, Johnny Farnham, by then nearly irrelevant to the top 40, was the first host. It came to be regularly presented by Ian Meldrum, a journalist, record producer, bon vivant, and possessor of his own unique brand of camp, who went on to become one of the most beloved figures in the Australian music industry. The show went on to run for 15 years, becoming a Saturday and Sunday night ritual for families all over the nation. It also heavily favoured local acts and played a major part in propelling the revival of Australian music through 1975 and 1976. Two weeks before Countdown premiered, Skyhawks with a new lead singer but otherwise sufficiently recovered from the mauling at Sunbury nine months before, released their debut album, Living in the 70s, produced by Ross Wilson. With its irresistible mix of the glammy and garage, plus its irreverent and unmistakably Australian focus in both the lyrics and the broad accent in which the new singer Graham Shirley Strawn sang them, the album set sales records for local albums, racking up 16 weeks at number one in 1975 and selling 240,000 copies in the year. All of this despite the handicap of six of the ten songs being banned from radio airplay. Along with, perhaps, the Master's Apprentices debut, it was the first truly great Australian album, and although it sparked a remarkably short career for Skyhooks, it revivified the local music industry. 1974 saw no fewer than 18 local acts in the end of year top 100. Although the proportion of novelty songs in that number is still distressingly high, and there were five extra entries from expatriates, Olivia Newton-John, and one from the Bee Gees being my personal favourite song of theirs, Mr Natural. Of these songs, the best and biggest were Albert's first blockbuster, the 11-minute three-part Sweet Evie, sung by ex easy beat frontman Stevie Wright with Malcolm Young playing a furious and fuzzy guitar solo on part one. Farewell Auntie Jack, not so much a novelty record, but a tribute to the increasingly absurdist and independently minded streak entering Australian comedy, was a good-natured soundtrack to the summer. Albert struck big again with Can't Stop Myself From Loving You, which peaked at number two for the historically problematic William Shakespeare. This really is for a later video, but in short problematic, because after hitting number one in December with My Little Angel, Shakespeare, already a full-blown alcoholic, through the agency of his cupidity, depravity or naivety, got caught for doing something very, very wrong and threw his career away in a heartbeat. The real tragedy is that when he got out of jail, he got a job, tried to settle down but couldn't stay off the source, so he ended up in Chelmsford Psychiatric Ward and in the hands of a monster named Dr Harry Bailey. So despicable were the crimes Bailey committed upon his patients that, while waiting for the findings of a royal commission, which is the highest investigative power in the Australian legal system, to come down against him, he killed himself rather than face justice. Not counting himself, he's held responsible for the deaths of over 80 people, 19 of them by suicide. And two of those deaths included William Shakespeare and Stevie Wright. More in a later video. Can't Stop Myself, though, is a stomping glam rocker with a wall of sound edge to it. Ernest folky Ross Ryan, a Sunbury headliner, had a couple of decent hits with the hippie-centric I Am Pegasus, released in 1973, but a number four hit, and the somewhat better Orchestra Ladies, which flirted with the nether regions of the charts for a few weeks. Personally, apart from a number of songs from Living in the 70s, my favourite were Mississippi's last great hit, Will I, very influenced by the band and their funky moments, the tune to Brian Cadd's perhaps last great hit, Let Go, has always struck with me, even if it was a devastatingly sad song. Local heroes Railroad Gin always made great records that never got national recognition they deserve, but a matter of time, which was no exception, was cool and funky. Sherbet had two big hits that year, the frankly rubbish Silvery Moon and the frankly wonderful Slipstream. The next two years it was Skyhooks vs Sherbet driving each other forward. It played out interestingly. In what was a remarkable year, we had so many great new things started. The difference was, this time, we followed through. 
1974 came to an end with three Australian singles in the top 10 plus one by the Bee Gees, the outlook for the local scene was sunny, with of course the obligatory Sunbury horror story. In 1975 things hit an all-time low. The crowd was down over 60% on previous years, it rained constantly, the side stages that had been set up for alternative performances of dance and poetry went unattended. All but one of the local acts went unpaid and that was because they had a private sponsorship. The only band that did get paid were Deep Purple who pocketed $60,000 which is $550,000 in today's coin. Now this story has more variants than the Queen story of the previous year but my understanding Understanding is that Deep Purple weren't going on unless they saw the cash up front. There being no cash to front, festival management drove down to Melbourne during the day to find a band, any band, to replace Deep Purple. The band they found was a scruffy troupe of troglodytes from Sydney who were still trying to find their way in the new market, who'd managed to touch the very lowest reaches of the chart with their last single, that band being ACDC. The fun and fracas started with various miscommunications, either tactical or through incompetence. Seeing Deep Purple's roadies set up their backline with no clear confirmation that Deep Purple would play. ACDC rock up, having left their gear in Melbourne for the gig they had later that evening, and proceeded to then plug into Deep Purple's backline. Roadie on roadie mayhem ensues. Malcolm Young enters the fray. Mayhem escalates. Eventually, compromises reach. Deep Purple are presented with literally a sports bag full of cash and they agree to go on. Now. ACDC can still play, but they need to go on after Deep Purple and they need to find themselves a backline in the meantime. ACDC bid them a terse no thank you and went back to their prior commitment, which was a good move, at least they got paid for the day's work. And Deep Purple played a blinder and when they returned to Australia for a full tour later in the year, they were advised that in order not to have industrial disruption on that lucrative tour, they would be well advised to donate a sum to a fund to ensure that the remainder of the Sunbury 75 acts got paid. $60,000 was the suggested sum and was duly forked over. It was to be the last Sunbury. So, obligatory summertime Farago notwithstanding, how did the Australian music industry continue its recovery? Brilliantly. 29 hits in the end of year top 100, 9 of them in the top 40, and 5 number 1 hits. The quality, from bare bones to teeny pop to Sherbet's attempt to fuse their prog and glam elements with the ambitious Life is for Living album, as well as two top 5 and one number 1 singles, Skyhook spending another 11 weeks at number 1 with their mid-year Ego is not a dirty word album, also racking up three top 5 singles with it. Alberts went from strength to strength. John Paul Young spent seven weeks at number one with Yesterday's Hero and followed it up with a perfect slice of top five pop in the love game. And ACDC released their first two albums along with two of their greatest anthems, High Voltage and It's a Long Way to the Top, which reached the charts in the last week of the year. ACDC also immediately grasped the power of video and countdown producing iconic videos for both. Hush took their stomping kitty glam into the top 10 on a couple of occasions, and the Little River Band, a band a long time being born, released their first single, which amazingly only made number 15. Billy Thorpe released my favorite song of his with It's Almost Summer. Renee Gayer announced herself on the charts with Heading in the Right Direction. And William Shakespeare, as mentioned previously, grabbed another number one for Alberts with My Little Angel. 1976 continued the triumphant stride forward. 28 hits in the end of the year top 100, 8 of them in the top 40 and 3 number 1 hits. This in a year when ABBA dominated the charts with relentless predictability, spending 30 weeks at number 1, 14 of them for the frankly dire Fernando, and racking up 10 chart hits altogether. For the Aussies, the biggest hit of the year was How's That by Sherbet, the only song that came close to challenging Abba's top of the chart hegemony, with six weeks at number one. Ted Mullery's impossibly politically incorrect Jump In My Car spent seven weeks at the top across Christmas 1975 and January 1976, being the biggest of the Albert Productions' 11 top 40 hits that year. Mulry had two other big hits, hitting number two with Darktown Strutter's Ball, a ridiculously rocked up version of a song from 1917, and one which has since been blacklisted by the Australian music industry. 
And number 11 with the fantastic Crazy. For me, one of the best power pop rock singles ever, Australian or otherwise. Ted went on to a few more minor hits and occasional live revivals, which were always good rocking fun, but sadly he passed away from cancer in 2001. He was a larger-than-life man, beloved by fans and fellows equally, and one of those who, by dint of talent and pluck, pulled Australian music out of a deep mire. John Paul Young had another baller year in 1976. His I Hate the Music hit number three, held out by a one-two at the top of the charts for the all-conquering Swedes, as well as another estimable effort and keep on smiling. Young had softened his approach a little to try for the countdown crowd, which was a move which shrewdly paid off. Reigning queen of pop, Marsha Hines charted strongly with her sophisticated but disposable AOR. Max Merritt and the Meteors crossed the Tasman again and went top three with what was to become the go-to song for drunken group sing-alongs, Slipping Away. On the back of strong albums, Skyhooks with the wonderfully titled Straight in a Gay Gay World and Sherbet with Life is for Living from late 1975 and the slightly underwhelming How's That, both released a crop of strong singles. Sherbet netted four top ten singles, the best of which was the wonderful standalone release Child's Play, which peaked at number four. Skyhooks managed only one top ten with a pretty great million dollar riff, but they were showing all the signs of a band that was being close to burned out. It would be two years before they again troubled the charts briefly and then broke up. ACDC went top 10 with Jailbreak and High Voltage. Future chart mainstays Mark Holden and Old 55 debuted. Old 55's records weren't much copper's records, but they were a finishing school for a lot of very fine musicians. The Angels came roaring out on Albert. John English troubled the charts for the first time, and future wimp rock overlords Air Supply also made their debut. Local rock warrior Carol Lloyd had a couple of strong Brisbane-only hits, Storm In My Soul being a huge favourite of mine. Doug Ashdown's Winter in America had a Scott Walkery vibe to it and is a much-loved staple on oldies radio. Little River Band had three excellent top 40 singles that went no further than number 20 between them, and Supernaut managed a couple of glammy top 20s, with the band in my hometown, I Like It Both Ways, almost cracking the top 10. With a return of four top 40, 17 top 100s and a single number one, ostensibly one could say the golden age was over by 1977. That's not really the case. Some might say it was more a matter of the local acts and producers not being able to adapt to the disco trend. If the last few years have taught us anything, it is that at this point Australian music was still an inherently conservative community and music, especially in the wake of festival culture in the first half of the decade, had become a different type of communal experience. More a celebration of proletariat solidarity or affiliation with a band's cult, the whole Sherbet Skyhooks kind of thing, and less a hedonistic and individual invocation for the Terpsichorean muse. About one-third of the entries in that year's top 40 were disco or disco-ish, but looking at the actual chart, it's mainly pop rock with diversions into straighter pop territory. Most likely it was just the local industry, after three years of huge expansion, just needed to take some time to regroup and work out new directions for itself. The fan scene was incredibly tribal. The realignment was to be a slow process, but a decisive one, because of out of it, Australian music developed both its own specific character and a worldwide base of operations. A lot of the dominant acts of the previous two years were conspicuous by their, if temporary, absence. ACDC were seemingly done as a top 10 machine and were directing their energies both overseas and into album sales. Hush couldn't take their teeny pop glam image and made no impression on the charts. Air Supply didn't really follow up Love and Other Bruises effectively, their singles hovering under the top 40. John Paul Young had but a single top 10 and a couple of other good records that didn't sell. And Skyhawks, now in seemingly terminal decline, had a single on the charts for but a hot minute, as did The Angels. Some established bands did well. Little River Band snatched the number one spot at the end of June with Help It's On Its Way, and Sherbet hit two with Magazine Madonna, but the rest of their output was well below their usual standard. Two New Zealand acts both started long and successful careers, and my hometown's greatest band ever, The Saints, saw their seminal 1976 recording, I'm Stranded, 
get some national chart traction in early 77. The biggest surprise of the year was Melbourne band The Ferrets, whose Don't Fall In Love made number two and was the biggest selling Australian record of the year. The Ferrets were almost entirely a creation of Countdown, even going so far as to have Ian Meldrum produce a single. And of course, liberal airplay time was devoted to them on the show. Once Countdown had proven their point that they could make an act and manipulate the charts with it, they lost all interest in the group and the hits dried up shortly thereafter. In four years, the local industry had gone from an insular mess propped up by a few acts, determined to match the standards of innovation and adventure set by the rest of the world in the fast expanding 70s, even if their efforts did come a little too close to imitation for comfort at times, to a bold and increasingly distinctive voice which charted its own course based on its own strengths, and as the subsequent three years would prove, looking to incorporate wider and wider influences.